We're going to be in the Gospel of John, which is the fourth of the four Gospels. They are the four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament. And we are going to be in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We're actually going to be looking at other, uh, chapter 14 and chapter 16 a little bit too. But right now we're just going to read. And I'm going to read chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. This is uh, Jesus in the middle of a, a long um, conversation. A lot of it is monologue from Jesus to his disciples in his last night with them before he was crucified the following day. So, uh, these are some of Jesus' very most important words to his followers. So he saved them for this moment. So John 15 Beginning at the top of the chapter, Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. A lot of people say that they don't want to any part of the church because the church is full of hypocrites. And they are entirely right about that. That is 100% true that the church is full of hypocrites. However, not all hypocrites are alike. For example, one kind of hypocrite is people who tell others to do something that they have no intention of doing themselves. You know, do as I say, not as I do, right? That kind of thing. That's, that's one kind of hypocrite, and that's bad, okay? The, the Lord does not like that. He does not love that. That has no place in the church. We shouldn't have that. Another kind of hypocrite is people who intend to do the right thing, and they're diligent about doing the right thing in one area of their lives, but they totally neglect doing the right thing in another area of their lives. And in fact, that other area might be even more important than the area that they're so focused on doing the right thing. That's also a bad kind of hypocrisy. Right? The, a kind of hypocrisy that, that is applying a standard in one area but neglecting another area is also not good. It's unacceptable. It's intolerable. God does not like it. It should have no part in the church. But a final kind of hypocrisy is people who try to do the right thing, but they screw up. They try to do the right thing. They say this is right, this is wrong, and they want to do what's right, and they say we should all be doing what's right. And then they mess up, and they don't do it. They believe in a standard, they try to meet it, and they fail. And the very best churches on planet Earth are filled to the brim with people like that, with that kind of hypocrite. They're called sinners, right? 
And, and frankly, I want to hang around with hypocrites like that. I love hypocrites like that. I, I, want, I want all of my friends, all of my neighbors, all of my family, all of my fellow church people to be like hypocrites, to be hypocrites like that. And it's not because sin is good. It isn't. Sin is evil. Screwing up is evil. Disobeying God is evil. Not meeting the standard is evil. The reason that I want to be around hypocrites like that, though, is because I would much rather have as my friends and neighbors people who have a high standard that they fail to meet sometimes than people with a low standard or no standard at all. Wouldn't you? I mean, would you rather have as your friends, as your neighbors, as your coworkers, as the people that you trust, the people that you elect into government office, people who have a high standard that they screw up and sometimes they don't meet it? Or would you rather have somebody who has no standards whatsoever? You know? So the thing is, you know, the, the very best people on planet Earth are hypocrites of that third sort. And the reason I'm telling you about hypocrisy today is as a setup to tell you that I'm going to preach a hypocritical sermon. Okay? Now, actually, pretty much as a rule, my sermons are hypocritical. I mean, they're basically all hypocritical. But this one today is especially hypocritical. Um, and probably, I'm getting the sense that a number of the sermons that I'm going to preach this year are going to be exceptionally hypocritical because I'm still struggling to put this into practice in my own life, big time, and I'm expecting that there's more of that to come. Today, I'm talking about achieving. I'm talking about achieving. And I'm defining achieving as doing something that gets you somewhere. It, there's a whole lot of stuff that can be applied as achieving or examples of achieving. Getting a good grade in a class is achieving. Getting a big crop out of your vegetable garden is achieving. Nailing the presentation that gets you the praise of your superiors at work. Putting a deck on the back of your house. Raising a child who succeeds. Increasing your net worth to double your annual income. All of these are examples of achieving. Achieving can be so compelling that some of us even do it with our leisure time. In other words, even when the external forces and expectations of our world are not demanding that we achieve, even in our own free time, we take that free time to go on achieving anyway. For example, visiting every major Eastern theater Civil War battlefield. Done it. Done it. Nailed it. My family's nailed it. Um, watching every episode of a 1990s NBC sitcom beating a video game on expert mode, creating a scrapbook of the life of each of your children from birth through high school graduation, benching a 5x5 five five at 225 pounds. Now I know those of you who are attempting to do this or are doing this are like, hey, no, I'm just doing that to be healthy. Yeah, right, because in order to be healthy, you need to have massive pecs. Okay, you know, you just go on living that fantasy. Okay, um, this is the stuff that we do, some of us, in our spare time, with our extra time, with our leisure time, that is continuing on achieving. Some of us achieve or endeavor to achieve nonstop. Some of us are miserable if we're not achieving something. Now, there's nothing wrong with achieving. In fact, where would we be without it? And surely there are many people who would benefit the world if they tried to achieve a lot more than they actually do. There are a lot of underachievers in this world who need to level up. But for those of us who are driven to achieve, which is probably not all of us here today, but is some of us, so those of us who are driven to achieve, who can hardly stop achieving, who can hardly rest and turn that off, even with our spare time, from getting straight A's to maintaining a beautiful lawn, why do we do it? Well, the reasons might be complex, and they might be different for every one of us. But I think that we achievers have one thing in common. It's the belief deep down that if I'm not achieving, I'm not living. If I'm not achieving, I'm not living. Maybe to you that means if I don't make the grade, then I'm worthless. Maybe to you it means if I don't have something to show for my time, then I've wasted my life. Maybe to you it means if I don't contribute constantly, then I will disappoint people, and then they will reject me. 
Maybe to you it means if I stop moving, then maybe I'll never start moving again. And then my world will collapse and I'll die hungry, alone, and ashamed. No matter what it is that we're thinking, if we believe deep down that if I'm not achieving, then I'm not living, we're believing a lie. And this is a lie that is hugely destructive. It robs years of our lives with worry, stress, and anxiety. It puts those around us on pins and needles constantly. And it sucks our attention into things that aren't nearly as important as we think they are while we neglect the most precious things and people that are right in front of us. Now, it is true that a full and healthy human life includes achieving. Look at the very first words that God said to the very first humans he created. In the book of Genesis, this is on the very first page, maybe the second page of your Bible, the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And in the very next chapter, God says uh, to Adam, we see here, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. This is when human life was perfect, right? This is perfect human living, and it includes work. It includes governorship. It includes cultivation. It includes caretaking. It includes creativity. This is all achievement and God made human beings to do this. He made us to do this. So achieving is not bad. It is part of being human. It is part of a full and healthy human life. But if we take that to an extreme where we think if a person that, a, that if I'm not achieving, I'm not living, if a person who isn't achieving isn't living, what does that say about a newborn baby? Who really, the only thing that they're achieving is trying to figure out what the heck is going on around them. What about an unborn baby? If a person who isn't achieving isn't living, what do we do with an unborn baby, which is called a baby if it's desired and a fetus if it's not? If a person who isn't achieving isn't living, what does that say about an elderly person in a nursing home? What does that say about Don Slippy right now? If a person who isn't achieving isn't living. It's probably going to be true of you at some point too. If a person who isn't achieving isn't living, what does that say about a severely de developmentally disabled adult? See, in a world that only values achievement, those people aren't living, or at least they aren't living a life worth living. And therefore, by that logic, it's no evil and it's no crime if those lives are destroyed because they aren't really lives at all. But that's a lie. It's satanic. Because as Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 8, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The devil is about untruths, and wherever you find an untruth that is deeply believed, you find a place where the devil has been at work, including if that's in your own mind and your own soul. And the devil tells lies because he knows they lead to destruction. The devil came to kill and steal and destroy. And so if it's a lie that if I'm not achieving, then I'm not living. And if that lie is destructive to me and to the people around me, then what is the truth? The truth is that if I'm not loving, I'm not living. If I'm not loving, then I'm not living. Now, loving looks different at different stages of life and in different relationships. And sometimes in your life, loving is purely receiving with gratitude, like that newborn baby. At other times, loving is giving whether you get gratitude or not. Loving looks different in different relationships, at different times, at different stages of life, but loving is living. Loving is living all the same. And the reason for this is in the nature of God himself. The, the man who wrote the book of John also wrote, the Gospel of John also wrote letters, three letters in the Bible, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And in the 1 John, first epistle of John, chapter 4, he writes, 
God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. See, God in his very nature is love. We worship a single God, one God, who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each of whom simultaneously is fully God, is fully divine, and yet is distinct from one another. All exactly alike, and yet distinct and one. All loving each other, all knowing each other, and all being loved by one another at all times from before God created anything else. And therefore, it is the very essence of God to love. Because God in his oneness is a community of love. God is not only love itself, God is life itself. You can't live without him. In fact, you don't live without him. You are breathing right now because of God. Because God in his creative power invented life and put the breath of life in you. And he can take it out whenever he wants. Real life, however, isn't just the involuntary being alive by God's grace, but voluntarily participating in the love that circulates within God that is overflowed to create the world. Our world ran away from God's love. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, rejected God's love to set themselves up apart from God's love. And that failed. And the brokenness and poverty of soul and of body in this world that leads to death for us human beings now is the result of that. But when human beings ran away from God's love, God's love surged even higher. John also says in this same chapter, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The way that God showed love to us is that even when we were unfaithful and rejected his love, even though we were created in the overflow of his love, the Father sent the Son to become human like us to win us back. To win us back by dying, by crucifixion, nailed to a cross. When we didn't love Him, He loved us to make His Son the atoning sacrifice. The technical word is the propitiation. The one who stands in the way to take away God's anger against evil so that, he could be that we could be reconciled to him and we could come back into the love that he has for us. So you can't live life without God's life and you can't ha fully have God's life without receiving God's love. If you don't receive God's love, you cannot live forever with God. And you can't receive God's love without giving it away again. Again. Right after this, John writes, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. So to repeat, it's not true that if I'm not achieving, then I'm not living. The truth is, if I'm not loving, then I'm not living. Because real life is found in God. And receiving that life means receiving His love by the grace that He's offered us if we have faith that Jesus is our go-between to come back to Him. And then if we've received that love, we're going to give it to somebody else. So then, loving is living. But a corresponding truth to that is, loving is achieving. To love is the real achievement. All these different things that we do in our work or in our leisure time or whatever, to check another box off of that list, to have achieved another standard, another benchmark, all of those achievements are fine as far as they go. But the real achievement is to love other people. If you're a lover, if you're somebody who loves other people, then you're a real high achiever. And Jesus in uh, 
John chapters 14 through 16, and we read a mi the, the middle chunk of that in the first half of chapter 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples and giving them a recipe for achievement. He wants them to achieve, but he defines for them what achievement is, what real achieving is. So I want to give you that recipe for achievement here today. It has four ingredients, four ingredients to this recipe for achievement. The first, re the first ingredient is keep Jesus' command to love. Keep Jesus' command to love. In John 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus is giving this analogy of a grapevine. And he says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? Makes sense, right? If you've got a grapevine, if there is a branch that is connected to the trunk, there's going to be grapes that come off. If it's cut off from the trunk, there's not going to be any grapes. It's that simple. If you remain in Jesus and he remains in you, then you will be productive. You will achieve. This is how you bear fruit. So then the question arises, how do you remain in Jesus? What does that mean to remain in Jesus? It's a strange term. Well, Jesus goes on to define it in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Okay, what does that mean, Jesus? If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Okay, Jesus, what is your commands? I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you, period. There you go. That's how you remain in Jesus. You remain in Jesus. In order to be productive and bear fruit, you need to remain in Jesus. The way to remain in Jesus is by keeping his commands. What is the command you need to keep? To love each other. Therefore, if you love other people the way Jesus Christ loved you, giving up his life for you, then you will be keeping his commands, you will be remaining in him, and you will be productive. You will bear fruit. You will achieve. So, the first ingredient for achievement, keep Jesus' command to love. Love people like Jesus loved people. You will achieve. Second ingredient for achievement, ask God for fruit. Ask God for fruit. Ask God to be productive. Ask God to enable you to achieve. Jesus talks about this too in verse 7. If you remain in me, and we know how to do that now, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. Wow, that's a big promise. Go down to verse 16. You did not choose me, Jesus says. But I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Look at these promises. Jesus is saying that if his command to love remains in you deeply, if his command to love remains in you deeply, and your ambition is to love other people, then no matter what you ask, from God the Father in Jesus' name, you're going to get it. Now that seems amazing, right? How, like, really? Like, I could ask for anything I want and I'm going to get it? Yes, you will. Do you know why? Because if Jesus' command to love remains in you deeply, what are you going to want? What are you going to want from God? I mean, if His command to love is so deeply ingrained in you, that that is what you wake up in the morning thinking about. That's what you're thinking about when you're closing your eyes at night. I mean, that is your ambition. That is your passion. That is your desire. What are you going to ask for? You're going to ask for the ability and the opportunity to love somebody else. That's what you're going to ask for. You're going to ask for what you want, and that's what you're going to want. And when you do that, when you ask God for the ability and the opportunity to love somebody else, you will get it. He will give it to you. He's not going to withhold that from you. And an outcome of that is that your joy 
will be complete. That's in chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus says in, in John 16, 24, until now you have, asked for, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. If you desire to love people that much and you ask for the opportunity to do it and you get it, guess what? You're going to be happy about it. You're going to be happy for the opportunity to love people. Your joy will be complete. And that is a major achievement. To have full joy, that's a big achievement. I would like to achieve that myself. I don't know about you. So the second ingredient for achievement is to ask God for fruit. The third ingredient is to receive the Holy Spirit. To receive the Holy Spirit. Look in John chapter 16, beginning at verse 7. We learn some about the Holy Spirit, who here is called the Counselor in the New International Version, the Helper, perhaps, in another translation. It says, But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Jesus says, Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Receive the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit does something that you can't do. The Holy Spirit convicts people or convinces people. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. Your best debating skills, your best persuasion, your best sales job cannot convince people of the things that are most important to their life. What is most important to their life is eternal life that is found in Jesus Christ. And the only person who can convince them of that is God the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit operating on them and speaking through you can convince people. And that is a major achievement. That is a major, major accomplishment. And He also guides you into the truth and tells you what is coming. So how do you receive the Holy Spirit? Again, ask. Ask. Ask the Father in the name of the Son for the Holy Spirit to be upon you in power and you will receive him. This is a sure thing. This is a can't miss. This is not a maybe, maybe not. This is real. This is going to happen. And when you have the Holy Spirit, you will achieve. Finally, the fourth ingredient for achievement is to trust who Jesus is. Trust who Jesus is. This is very basic, but absolutely critical. If you look in, in chapter 14 of the Gospel of John, Jesus says in John 14, verse 10, Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And what does it mean to, to believe in Jesus or to have faith in Jesus? It means more than casual agreement. It means more than, oh yeah, well, I guess I believe that that's who Jesus is because that's what Pastor Corey said or that's what my mom said or you know, that's what that dude on TV says or whatever. No, 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 it means more than that. The kind of faith that Jesus ta is talking about is betting your life on Jesus being the Son of God. Betting your life that the Father and the Son are two but are also one. Betting your life that it's Jesus' death on the cross that reconciles you to God. And the outcome of trusting who Jesus is, is that you will do what Jesus did and do even greater things than that. Now let's review what Jesus did in the Gospel of John. If we were going to go back to the previous 13 chapters, what all did Jesus do as John tells the story? Well, he turned water into wine. That's the first thing he did. He healed a person from a deadly illness. 
He healed a person who was sick with a chronic illness for 38 years. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children out of five small, small loaves of bread and two fish. He gave sight to a man who was born blind, and he brought back to life a man who was dead for four days. Those are the things that Jesus did, and he said the person who trusts in me will do those things, and will do even greater things than that. Even greater things than that. Now, I would say that doing just those things for people would be a pretty great achievement. I'd say that would be a pretty great accomplishment right there. So much so that it's impossible for many people to believe that, it, that, that this is going to happen. But you can achieve these great things and even greater ones. And here's why. First of all, it is foolish to estimate what God can do through a person based on your own limited experience. Just because you've never seen somebody raise somebody from the dead after four days doesn't mean that it doesn't happen and can't happen. There are people around the world and including in this country who are doing the kinds of things that Jesus did in the Gospel of John. Just because you haven't met them yet and just because no news media would report it because they wouldn't want to be laughed at if they reported such a thing doesn't mean that it isn't happening all around every day. Miracles in the name of Jesus are occurring. I'm sure hundreds or thousands of them have already happened today somewhere in the world. Secondly, and more importantly, these things that Jesus did in the Gospel of John were signs that pointed to himself. Why? Because Jesus himself is the miracle. Jesus himself is the miracle. God becoming man is the greatest miracle of all, followed closely by human beings becoming divine by the Holy Spirit coming into them and by being resurrected in the last day into a body like Jesus had. Jesus himself is a bigger deal than all the miracles he did. Jesus did the miracles to draw attention to himself. And, 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 and he drew he, to draw attention to himself. And often what he would do is he would do a miracle and people would be so into the miracle, he would say, okay, now look at me. I'm the big miracle. And people wouldn't even really pay attention to him. They just wanted more of the stuff. They just wanted more of the stuff. But the thing is for you, if you draw someone's attention to Jesus so that they believe him, that is the miracle. That is the miracle. You might think, well, it's not that big a deal. I mean, I just persuaded somebody. It's not the same as raising from the dead. You want to bet? You want to bet it's not like raising from the dead? Because what God is seeing when you tell somebody about Jesus and they believe, God sees somebody raised from the dead. God sees somebody raised from the dead because we are born spiritually dead into sin. And when somebody trusts in Christ, they have just been raised from spiritual dead with the promise of being raised from physical death in the last day. So let me tell you something. You think it was a big deal that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after four days? If you convince somebody to trust Christ for salvation, then you've just raised somebody from the dead who's been dead for 20 or 40 or 60 or 80 years. That is a greater thing than Jesus himself did when he was walking on this planet. So yes, you can do greater things. You think it's hard to open the eyes of somebody who's been born blind? Anybody who comes to faith in Jesus Christ through your teaching, through your talking, has just had their eyes open to reality who has been born blind. Amen. Amen. I, this, is, you know, this is not just a figure of speech. This is far more real than a physical miracle. Truly, it is. Let me return to what I said before. It is not true that if I'm not achieving, then I'm not living. But it is true that if I'm alive in Jesus, then God achieves through me. Loving is achieving. Asking and receiving the Holy Spirit, and most of all, trusting in Christ is achieving too. No matter how insignificant your life may look to you now, no matter how barren and unproductive it may seem, no matter how far you seem to be falling behind everyone around you, no matter how much wasted time you see in the expanses of your days, if you are loving, you are achieving. And God is already doing awesome works through you. You just haven't seen them yet. So which ingredient in the recipe do you most need to add to your life? 
They're listed in the response card in the bulletin that you received today. If you take that out of your bulletin and you take that and tear it in half, you see that on one side it says First Baptist Church. And if you flip that side over, it has the four ingredients for achievement. I want you during this next song that, that Kelly's going to play to consider which of these four most needs to be added to your life this week or added to your life forever. There's also a blank space to add something more if you want to. Take a pen or a pencil out and take this time with God one-on-one -on -one to answer Him, to commit to Him, here's what I'm going to add to my life to achieve this week. And then take that card and slide it in your pocket or put it in your purse or in your Bible or someplace to take it home with you. Leave that then in a place that you can see it through the week as a reminder of what you've told the Lord today. And then take the second the other side of the card and there's a space to write your name and please write your name there I'd like everybody to do that it's very helpful to me and also in our administration of the church but also for me as a shepherd as a pastor write your name on that and any contact information you'd like to share with us that we don't have for you and on the flip side of that card there's other messages pre-filled in and some blanks as well that you can send to me to communicate with me take this side of the card and as you're walking out after worship at the top of the stairs there's a little wall mount container that you can set this in, and I ask you to do that. But take this time with the Lord to determine what is the ingredient for achievement that He wants to add to my life.